strategies do you use when helping people with um, anxiety disorders, phobia disorders, and phobias, um, panic disorder, I'm sorry, um, learn to successfully cope with it? You have like three disorders there that you're asking about? Um, well, it's anxiety disorder, panic disorder, disorder, and phobias. Okay. Uh, generally, uh, the treatment is, is pretty close to the same. Uh, like a specific phobia, for example, uh, if the individual could tolerate it, uh, you would use an exposure therapy where you would uh, gradually expose the person to it either through using imagination, uh, you know, say you're afraid of snakes, maybe have you imagine a snake while doing a relaxation uh, technique, uh, then move it towards uh, having a snake maybe in an aquarium in the room. Uh, and maybe having that aquarium of the snake uh, on the lap while doing relaxation techniques and finally maybe petting the snake. Uh, and uh, that's an exposure therapy uh, for someone that can't tolerate that and just imagining it getting closer and closer and closer while using a, a relaxation technique. Uh, the, another one of the anxiety disorders, like a general anxiety, is that what you're asking about? Yes. Uh, general anxiety is uh, a little bit different. Uh, there, there's nothing that the person identifies as a trigger for anxiety, so you would uh, probably do a cognitive behavioral therapy, and that would involve uh, journaling. Uh, and they would have the individual pay attention to whatever events seem to trigger the uh, anxiety, and, uh, and then have the individual pay attention to what the automatic thoughts were. Uh, and then in therapy they would bring in those, uh, the journal and the automatic thoughts and I would train them to figure out ways to uh, correct the thoughts that are usually irrational and take the intensity of anxiety and jack it way up and bring it down to where it probably really, really belongs at. Uh, that type of treatment, 8 to 16 weeks, 18, 8 to 16 sessions. What was the third one that you had down? Uh, panic disorder. Panic disorder. Uh, like an agoraphobia or agoraphobia without a panic disorder. Uh, it's when an individual uh, is feeling, you know, having panic attacks. Uh, I have actually a handful of people that come in for panic disorder right now, currently on my caseload. Um, the, the treatment, again, is... Uh, cognitive and behavioral. Uh, quite often while they're in the office, uh, sorry, <laughs> I can get rid of that one, but I can't stop the other one. But we can't avoid my lame message. <laughs> uh, and that's good news for all of us. Let me see Probably. if it's someone that's going to call back. Okay. One more. Is that four? Okay. Uh, so the individual, uh, the problem that they have is they pay too much attention to what happens within their body when they start to have a panic attack. And uh, when they pay close attention to what's happening with their body, uh, their thoughts uh, tend to make the matters worse by telling them that it's something that's much worse than it really is. Then they pay more attention as their body uh, reacts to those thoughts. So if, I'm, uh, if I notice that I'm kind of like breathing quickly and that my heart is racing and I tell myself, oh my God, I think it's a heart attack, and then I go, wow, a heart attack, I can die, and, you know, the body reacts more and more and more to the fearful things, and what you would do is you would sensitize them to uh, correcting those thoughts in the earliest possible period uh, in the cycle, and again, you know, when I talked about using relaxation techniques, for all anxiety, uh, one of the starting points is teaching some, teaching the client, uh, how to relax, and uh, that could be a yoga technique or just deep breathing, or it can be a progressive muscle relaxation. There's all kinds of relaxation techniques. The idea here is that anxiety, muscle tension being keyed up, and relaxation don't ever coexist at the same time. The deep breathing also stops the cycle of a panic attack because they tend to hyperventilate, and if they could just make their breathing be very smooth in, very smooth out. They can, you know, those, those types of tools, uh, the combination of things, 
can help prevent the panic attack and will help a person manage it. I hope that wasn't too much information. Oh, no, no, that's, that's okay. good. Thank you. Um, you were talking about relaxation um, techniques to help them cope with it, though. How effective is that? Like uh, yoga? Uh-huh. Well, yoga is uh, very, very effective. Uh, it's just a... Uh, it's a it's a breathing and a relaxation uh, exercise, but it does one other thing. It takes the mind out of so much what the thoughts are and what's going on around the person, and and kind of puts it inward in a peaceful sort of a way. Um, you know, I don't know a lot about yoga myself. I do know what the deep breathing uh, uh, techniques are that people who practice yoga use, though, and it's supposed to be very very effective. <clears throat> in your professional experience, which theories and medications are the most effective in treating your clients and patients? Well, <laughs> I think you're Once I just got through talking about <laughs> there Are there any medications, though? You talked about the relaxation techniques, but are there any medications that you use that are, like, really effective? I'm a licensed clinical social worker. I don't prescribe anything because I don't have the educational background for it. Uh, I do have people that come in that are already on medications. Uh, for anxiety, and uh, the problem with anxiety medication is that it's uh, it's highly addictive. Mm -hmm. uh, the person, once they are dependent upon that to manage their anxiety, uh, you know, to to come off of it, you have to have some sort of skills in place to be able to do that effectively, and. Uh, and then it's got to be monitored by a physician, and you know, people usually come off of it gradually. Um, so they still end up at a spot where they have to get skills to manage their anxiety, and uh, you know the medication is just coming off of that as an additional step. Did I answer the question, or did I answer something different? Oh no, you, you okay. did. <laughs> All right. Um, anxiety disorder has many identified causes, but how can these be prevented or intervened? There are, there are a lot of different kinds of anxiety disorders. Uh, you know, the, the fastest answer <clears throat> for helping a person not be anxious is to have that individual confront whatever the fear is that they have as early as possible. So whatever it is that uh, the person tries to avoid, the more that they try to avoid it, uh, the more powerful it becomes. So exposure to that thing. Uh, and if it's thoughts or beliefs or circumstances, uh, you know, in, in the environment or whatever, uh, the person should go and try to tolerate it as much as they can so that their mind gets the message that there's not danger in that situation. Now, you know, sometimes it's good to have anxiety. You know, just down the block from where I work is uh, Sin City. If you start wandering around there at nighttime <laughs> and stuff and you aren't feeling anxious, uh, something's wrong. <coughs> Uh, when evaluating the differences between anxiety and panic disorder, what, what possesses do you use, processes do you use? I'm sorry. When evaluating what processes? What, when evaluating the differences between anxiety and panic disorder, what processes do you use? Well, you know, I, I do a psychosocial evaluation, and you know, here's the DSM-4. Oh, yeah. It's got all of the diagnoses for uh, all the mental health disorders to include the anxiety disorders. And what you do is you can try to get as much information about the onset of, uh, of you know, the anxiety, for example, when it first started, uh, what, what circumstances that it began in. Uh, you want to know how long it's been going on, so that would be the duration. You'd like to know how severe uh, the symptoms are, you know, if they're truly debilitating and the person is fearful to leave the home or... You know, if they just make a person somewhat uncomfortable and, uh, you know, you would like to know if it's specific to a thing or a situation or, you know, like in the general uh, anxiety where they can't quite put their finger on it. There's also a post-traumatic stress disorder that's located in the anxiety family where, uh, you know, it's caused by some sort of extremely stressful traumatic event. And uh, you know, if you can avoid extremely stressful traumatic events, that's great. Sometimes you can't get into a good car accidents sometime and see how you feel about getting behind the wheel of a car after that. 
suddenly become aware that at 70 miles an hour, uh, you really are quite vulnerable. Um, <laughs> after you do the assessment, though, uh, after you get gather the, the criteria for that, you just you open up the book and you start looking through and you see what it lines up with best as far as the anxiety disorders. And, uh, you know, there's an overlap. It's, sometimes it's hard to winnow out. And the onset of the symptoms and how long they've been going on also kind of determines uh, which disorder you would go with. There's something really mild called an adjustment disorder with anxiety. Uh, it's not always mild, though. You know, there's like a stressful event that happens for a person, and it's a very, very big deal, and they overreact to it. And until, uh, until that event is uh, resolved or whatever, they, they continue to feel pretty significant anxiety. And if that stressor goes away and they still feel anxiety, then it changes to something else. So it would be like a different disorder? It would be a different anxiety disorder at that point. Okay, so basically with that book, you look at all the symptoms you mm -hmm. have, how long it's been, yeah. and you look in that book and see what it is. It, it's just, how, do, how would you do that? Is it like well, you know, it's like a cookbook. You, you open it up and um, this is the anxiety section right here. Mm -hmm. And you would compare uh, what, the, what the symptoms are to what the cookbook says. Pick one out, for example. I got social phobia right here. Uh, there's like three to four pages of background. And then you would look at the A, B, C, D all the way through H, and it talks about what it would take. And if it doesn't have what it, you know, what's necessary for the diagnosis, they don't have the diagnosis. For example, on A in this one, a marked and persistent fear of one or more social performance situations in which the person is exposed to unfamiliar people or to possible scrutiny of others. The individual fears that he or she will act in a way or show anxiety symptoms that will be humiliating and embarrassing. And it gives a note, in children there must be evidence of the capacity for age-appropriate social relationships with familiar people and the anxiety must occur in a peer setting, not just interaction with adults. Now, I think they throw that in because little bitty babies uh, kind of recognize their parents and they you know, have some uh, anxiety uh, when they're brought out towards strangers. Um, but that's, you know, that's just A, and there's, there's other criteria as it goes down. Um, I'm going to tell you one of my favorite uh, diagnoses for uh, anxiety disorders. It's right here. Can you see it okay? Um, I have a question. Does, wait, when you want to diagnose Which side? somebody, do they have to have one side. from A through, through H, or can they miss one? Um, you know, in the cookbook, it <laughs> it talks about, you know, can, here I'll use the obsessive compulsive disorder, for example. Um, they, they say you've got to have either obsessions or compulsions. And, uh, you know, it gives you the criteria uh, for what an obsession is and for what a compulsion is. Uh, but on A, if you need to have just one or the other to get the diagnosis, you're good. Okay. Um, and the one I just uh, showed her was anxiety disorder, not otherwise specified. Oh. Uh, you uh, can use that one, and uh, you can probably see a client for quite a while before the insurance company wants you to go ahead and narrow it down a little bit. It's kind of like an anxiety catch-all. It's the uh, lazy therapist way. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, last question. Um, what are the most common that you see, like, on a daily, not a daily basis, but in your okay. Uh, you know, they, let me just go through them real quick. Um, the anxiety disorder in OS is uh, very, very good for a lot of folks. <laughs> uh, I do see generalized anxiety pretty regularly. Um. Here's a disorder I don't use much, acute stress disorder. Uh, Post-traumatic stress, I've got several of those coming in right now. Uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, I don't see hardly at all. I've been doing this a long time. Really? Very, very small number of people. I yeah. thought that was really common. Yes. Oh, no. Okay. I'm not. <laughs> okay. Well, I know people think that they've got obsessive compulsive <laughs> disorder, but... You know, it's a, it's a much bigger deal than just wanting things to be neat and tidy and in order. So, uh, if they're going to get the diagnosis from me, it's got to cause a pretty significant disruption in their overall functioning. 
the social phobia. I don't actually see too much social phobia. I, I'm currently working with one person that has trouble speaking in public, so just one on the case over right now. Um, let's see what else we got. Well, that would be specific phobia, not social phobia. Well, maybe it could be a social. So I'd have to sit down and narrow it out a little bit more. Um, so after you like visit with your clients, do you sit down and kind of review what has happened or what you've heard, and then you determine what what to diagnose them with, or you do an assessment and you know. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just take the answer as the most common for what I have coming in here. Most people have some sort of insurance that pays, mm -hmm. and uh, the insurance doesn't give me, you know, many, many hours to sit down and assess a person. It generally gives one to two hours. Uh, that's really, you know, not, not the most amount of time that you can use to get a really great clinical impression. So based on that little bit of time and the person being a cooperative reporter of symptoms and, you know, telling you as much as they feel comfortable telling you, you know, you start off with a diagnosis uh, that, that looks like it's right. And, you know, over time uh, you get a better clinical impression as you're actually working with the person. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. Bad, guys. I'm scared. I don't want to delete it. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm <laughs> <laughs>